Weather is very important to understand because it involves every single flight you take. We're going to take a look at the overview of the weather, how weather is created, or what causes the weather. We're going to look at the fronts and the pressure systems, thunderstorms and icing, all sort of things to help you be a better and safer pilot. First, let's look at the layer of the atmospheres. The first layer of the atmosphere that's closest to the Earth is called the troposphere. And you may ask yourself, well, how could air have layers? Well, it's because of the characteristics of each layer of atmosphere that they hold. For example, um, our layer of atmosphere closest to the Earth called the troposphere is most affected by gravity. As the air molecules, which have mass, they're affected by gravity, they're pulled down toward the Earth. And so it creates a, a constant change in temperature and pressure as you get further and further away from the gravitational pull of the Earth. So if this is the Earth, for example, our layer of atmosphere where most of our weather is contained is called the troposphere. But it's not a very round shape that surrounds our Earth. This would be the equator. And the reason why it's not a very round circle is because how the sun heats the Earth. As the sun hits mo uh, heats mostly the equator region, that's where the air is the hottest and it expands. So the troposphere layer where the equator is usually ranges around 60,000 feet. And near the poles, where the air is colder and more dense, um, usually is about 20 to 25,000 feet. And why that's important to understand is because this layer of atmosphere that sort of traps our weather is how big our thunderstorms typically would be. If you're closer to the equator, the base of thunderstorms range anywhere from three to 5,000 feet on average, but the tops of the thunderstorms usually go, or can easily go up to the top of the troposphere. So in an area closer to the equator, the top of the thunderstorm very easily could go to 55,000 feet. Well, that's a lot of energy, and that would be very dangerous for pilots. But if you were up in a, a more northerly uh, region, such as Alaska, then the storm may only get 25 or 30,000 feet, which would not be as much energy. We also want to take a look at um, what the, uh, the air characteristics are as we start from the Earth's surface and work our way out toward um, the top of the troposphere. And if I took a slice of this air right here and we examined it, examined it a little more closely, it may look something like this. Down near the Earth, the air molecules would be closer together because they're more affected by gravity, or the weight of the other air molecules are compressing them down, actually. And as you go higher in the atmosphere, the air molecules will become spaced farther and farther apart. And we, we have a couple standard values that you need to commit to memory. And the pressure value at sea level is 2992 inches of mercury. And where this comes from is the barometer. The barometer is basically a cup filled full of mercury that, for example, there's an upside down test tube stuck in there. And the test tube would be measured on the side in inches. So when the weight of the atmosphere presses down on the mercury level, then we get a reading in inches. And standard at sea level, is 2992. And I guess somebody stayed at sea level and measured the pressure and the temperature for a year and this was the overall average. I'm not really sure where this value came from, but we use it for standard. The standard temperature at sea level is 15 degrees Celsius. Also is 59 Fahrenheit. But we're going to remain talking about Celsius because that's what most of our charts and how the weather is given to us for pilots. Now, if we have cold air that's heavy and dense and it pushes down, it will push down on the mercury and allow the mercury to rise in the tube and it would give us a higher reading. So, for example, uh, 31.2 inches of mercury. And on a day where the air is warm or light, then the air would rise and it would push less uh, pressure down on the mercury and give us a lower reading on the barometer. So, for example, 2952. Now, I do want you to keep in mind that even though 2992 is our standard, when we talk about pressures and temperature, we talk about them in relation to each other. 
For example, if you had on Earth, uh, right here, the pressure was 31.2, but another area right beside it, the pressure was 30.52, then this may be considered a high pressure and this would be considered a low pressure because we always look at them in relation to each other. Now, uh, the other characteristic uh, of our troposphere is for every thousand feet we go up in the atmosphere, we lose about an inch of mercury per thousand feet and we also lose two degrees Celsius per thousand feet. So let's look at the pressure first. If this were sea level and we started at 2982 and we go up a thousand feet, we no longer are weighing these air molecules. So the pressure would drop to 2892. If we go up another thousand feet, the pressure would drop to 2792. Another thousand feet, 2692, and so on. So the pressure drops very consistently as you go up in the atmosphere. The temperature also drops. If 15 is where we started at sea level and we go up a thousand feet, there is less pressure pulling or squishing those molecules together. And when you compress molecules of air together, it creates friction because remember everything is in constant random motion. So if your molecules are closer together, there's more friction, which is more heat. But as we go higher in the atmosphere and the molecules begin to separate, then there's less chance for friction, so there's less heat. The temperature drops consistently at, on a standard day, uh, 2 degrees Celsius per 1,000 feet. So if you went up 1,000 feet, the temperature would be 13. If you go up another 1,000 feet, the temperature would be 11. Another 1,000 feet, the temperature would be 9, and so on. When we look at this measurement of temperature up, as we go up in the atmosphere, we call that lapse rate. L-A-P-S-E, lapse rate. And the example that I just wrote here was, is a standard lapse rate, 2 degrees Celsius per 1,000 feet. Now, not every day is like that. And matter of fact, not many days <laughs> are like that. But the standard lapse rate would work uh, like this. You start at 15 degrees, and you lose 2 degrees Celsius per 1,000 feet. But if they measured the, the temperature today, and it was something other than this, you still call it a lapse rate. The lapse rate is just the measurement of temperature as you go up. The next thing we need to look at is how the airflow patterns circulate around the Earth. And this is what actually is, causes our easterly and westerly flows and typically brings the storms to certain regions. Because the sun heats the equator region, that air is the warmest, so it will rise. And as this air rises, it basically stays trapped by our troposphere and as it rises it cools because of less friction and as it cools it'll make a journey toward the North Pole and on its journey it continues to cool off until it becomes heavy and dense and sinks and as the air sinks and starts to make its journey back toward the equator it'll heat back up again because it's being compressed so we have a big overall flow of air that circles around um, the globe. and the southern hemisphere, it will be the opposite. We're going to talk about just the northern hemisphere since that's where we're flying. Now, sometimes when the air rises, it'll cool very rapidly. It'll, it'll cool so quickly that it'll fall back down. It won't make that full journey. And sometimes as the air descends around the polar region and sprawls across the, uh, the polar area there, um, it'll heat up by compressing before it makes the whole journey. So we may have another area that rises. So we have a big overall pattern, but then we have a couple little cycles or little circles or cycles that continue all the time as well. Now, when our, our weather is basically, the cause of our weather is because of uneven heating of the Earth's surface. And that, the big overall picture would be because the sun heats the equator more than it does the north pole, the poles. But also even on smaller scales, such as um, the oceans uh, being heated at a different rate than the land, or even um, forests being heated at a different rate than uh, open fields, or something like that. But it is the uneven heating of the Earth's surface that creates all of our weather. Now, as the, the air rises and falls, um, and it moves around the U.S. or around the uh, Earth. It, it's not allowed to go in a straight line. It gets deflected off to the right in the northern hemisphere and off to the left in the southern hemisphere. And they call this deflection the Coriolis effect. It, 
If we had a spinning disc and I asked you to draw a line from the center straight out, as the disc is, as the disc is spinning, then you would end up drawing a curved line because as you were trying to draw your straight line, the disc was moving underneath you. And that's the same thing that happens with the air trying to flow across the earth. As the earth spins underneath and the air tries to flow, it gets spun off to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. So if you could imagine, this is a profile view, but if we looked at an aerial view of the air trying to leave the equator, like out toward this way, as it rises, it gets deflected off to the right. And as it sinks, it gets deflected off to the right. So this creates these easterly and westerly flows that helps drive our weather patterns around the world. Now you don't really have to memorize these different airflow patterns, but it does help you understand um, you know, how these fronts and pressures build and dissipate and so on.